Valentine's Day, I want to speak to you about a destitute life. The thing about Valentine is we express our love to one another, especially family members. But the great thing about the Lord's love is it is never limited by time. It's never limited by place. And it is never limited by who is in need with Him. One of the great things about the Lord's love and compassion was that no matter the condition of the recipient, whoever came to Him, He never held back that love and that compassion that He had for individuals. The most poor, downcast, poor, needy, those that had nowhere to go but up would come to Him and immediately out of His being would come compassion and love for that person. He loved people so much that He would even hang around sometimes with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, because of his great compassion and love for everyone. He did not hold back when some came to, to him that were totally overwhelmed by the sin in their lives. And if you will think about the Lord, he never condemned not one person that came to him. It never came out of his mouth. The great thing, too, about the Lord was this. When anyone came to Him, no matter who they were, no matter what condition, no matter what circumstances they were in, they left richer than they were before they met the Lord. And the richness of His love and His compassion would change them. There was a leper that came and fell at his feet. Now, think about leprosy and the leper at that time. Leprosy was a tremendous, terrible skin disease. And sometimes it would break out in boils on the person, lesions on the person, and in extreme cases it could even disfigure the skin in some ways. So here is a man that has, has this disease. And in some cases, the Jews would look at someone who had leprosy as a sinner. Somehow they had sinned against God, and, and this was their lot in life. They were shunned by society totally. If anyone approached them, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, to let that person know that they had leprosy. Totally rejected. You've got a man here that lives an isolated life. If the city was a walled-in city, they were not allowed to go into that city within the walls. They had to stay outside. So here is a man that has faced rejection the whole time he has had this disease. No one wanted to be around him, and certainly no one wanted to come close to him to touch him. They would just go the opposite way, and he would be left there standing. But he came and he fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, think about this. In a way, it was a risk for him to do that. Because he did not know the reaction he was going to get from the Lord. For instance, the first thing he said, Lord, if you are willing. He didn't know what the Lord was going to say, what he was going to do, or if the Lord was going to back away from him like everybody else did. The Lord looked at him, and then the Lord did something, something unthinkable. He touched him. And I'm sure the disciples and the others were there were totally shocked. 
when he reached out and touched that leper. And then the compassion, the love. It said, Jesus, filled with compassion, said, I am willing. You know, you may be here today. You're in some circumstances. You don't know what to do. And in some ways, you're wondering, because of things going on in your life, if Jesus is willing. I can assure you, no matter your circumstances, Jesus always has his arms open with love and compassion. And he will instantly say to you, I am willing. Jesus was walking toward the city of Nain. There was a great crowd that followed him. As he walked toward the city gates, there was a funeral procession coming outside the city. And as the procession came forward, he saw a woman, a widow woman. He looked at her. Here was a woman now that had lost her husband already. And now her only son was dead. And in those days, the eldest son was obligated. If the dad or the husband had passed away, he was obligated to take care of his mom. So here she is now. She's lost her husband, she's lost her son now, and she's totally destitute. And I'm sure it was running through her mind, who's going to take care of me now? When Jesus saw her, this is what it says about him. It says, his heart went out to her. Love and compassion. As his heart went out to her, he looked at her and he said, don't cry. So he walks up to the coffin. Young man, get up. And the man rose up. So what in one moment was the woman, the widow, destitute circumstances, now she was made much richer because she had contact with the Lord. There was other people that came to Jesus. Some of them had done everything they knew to do. They'd gone everywhere. They were totally destitute. They didn't have anybody else to go to. There was a woman. A crowd was going down the street with Jesus and in the midst of that crowd... There was a frail, broken woman. She had had an issue of blood for 12 long years. She was weak, and she was totally destitute. She had been to every doctor that she knew to go to, that she could be better. And instead of her getting better, she got all the worse. Here she was, weak, frail. Not only was she weak physically and poor physically, she had spent all her money, all she had, on trying to get help. All she had. So here she is, A woman weak, frail. She's broken. She's broken emotionally. She's broken physically. She's even broken financially. And she heard about Jesus. So in her destitute state, she makes her way through the crowd... And she said, if I could only just touch him. 
And as soon as she touched his robe, she was healed. In one moment, she was totally destitute. And in the very next moment, it only took a touch of his robe for her to be made richer. For her to be made whole. For 12 long years, she had stumbled along in destitution. And then now, here she is, whole, complete, and rich in the Lord. There was another man. <clears throat> Jesus excuse me, had been on the Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples. And they were coming down from the mountain. And when they came down from the mountain, Jesus saw some people gathered around in a crowd, and it was like they were arguing with each other. There were Pharisees there that were arguing and all. So he comes down with the disciples and what I love about this is what uh, the word says. It says, when the people saw Jesus, they were filled with wonder. He comes up to the crowd and he says, what are you arguing about? They begin talking and then all of a sudden a man cries out. He said, Lord, my son is demon possessed. Let me just say one thing right here, saints. Listen, it's wonderful that we can be on the mount with the Lord and behold His glory. But saints, we have to leave the mount and go down to the demon-possessed valley below. We're not made to stay on the mount. We're made to walk with the Lord in this demon-possessed world that we live in. So Jesus, he says, what are you arguing about? And this man cries out, my son, he's demon possessed. A spirit has hold of him. And every time this spirit gets hold of him, he tries to kill him. Throws him in the water, tries to throw him in the fire to kill him. Here is a father that is looking at his son. He's totally destitute. He doesn't know what to do other than to fall down at Jesus and say, can you help me? And even while the Lord was standing there, the Spirit took hold of that boy. He fell down. He foamed at the mouth, wallowing around, even while Jesus was standing there. The Father was standing there, and Jesus asked him, how long has he been this way? And listen at this destitute cry that came from this father. He says, as of a child, he's been this way. We can do nothing. Then he says, but if you can help us. And then the Lord said, out of his love and compassion, if... All things are possible to him that believes. Now listen to this destitute cry that came from this father. The Lord didn't rebuke him and say, you don't have enough faith. He cried out to the Lord, Lord, I do believe and listen to the destitution coming out of his mouth. Help me overcome my unbelief. Never think that the Lord will not touch you because you haven't overcome all your unbelief. Never let the devil tell you, hey, you don't have enough faith. There's no use in coming to Jesus. The Lord speaks a word. The boy is delivered totally. And he gives him back to his father. Here was destitution in one moment. And in the next moment, they're rich. So very rich. Throughout this message, I'm going to use the words rich, poor, needy. And I'm in no way talking about money, saints. 
Think about the Lord. <clears throat> Think about him when he came down from heaven. Emptied himself of all the glory. He was destitute as a man. The Son of Man came down emptied. But then he was filled with the Spirit when he was commissioned by the Father. But think about what our Lord said about himself. He said, by myself, I can do nothing. The Lord never did anything apart from his Father. Never. There was never any independence in him. Even though he knew he was the Son of God. He was totally dependent on the Father. In fact, he even said, the Father tells me what to say and how to say it. He would never even speak unless the Father told him to speak. He wouldn't go to any place unless the Father told him to go. He was totally dependent as a man on his Father. Think about you and I. Can we say we are totally dependent on the Father? Because you know what Jesus had to say about you and I? He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, there's no one else you can go to that can take care of the circumstances in your life. One of the first messages that were recorded by the Lord was what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He was talking to the people, and the very first thing that Jesus said was, Blessed are the poor. Now I want you to understand something when Jesus said that. Because as soon as he said, Blessed are the poor, they were in total shock. Because you see, the Jews had been raised to believe by the Pharisees that if you were rich, you had an automatic ticket to heaven. You were blessed of God. But if you were poor, that was just your lot in life. When he said, blessed are the poor... I remember when the Lord met the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler, he told him to give up everything that he had. And he walked away. And then the Lord said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And listen at the question the disciples asked him. They asked him this question, well, who then can be saved? Why? Because they thought that the rich were the ones that were going to heaven and everybody else was struggling to get there. Blessed are the poor. Not the mighty. Not the rich. Not the powerful. Blessed are the poor. But then the thing is this. Jesus was not talking about money at all. Even though that's what they were thinking. And let me just say this, saints. We have to be careful here because we live in a society that is raised on a money God. When there's far greater riches than money. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Spiritual beggars. Those that come to him and say, Lord, I'm poor, I'm needy, I can't do it, I cannot make it on my own without you. Spiritual beggars. Think about this in your fellowship with the Lord. Let me ask you this question. Are you a spiritual beggar? When it comes to your fellowship with the Lord. Have you come to the point in your life. 
where you can't get enough of Jesus. Have you come to the place in your fellowship with Him? That if you don't daily come to Him and walk with Him daily, you know, you know that it is something missing. And you're saying to the Lord, as the Apostle Paul said, I stretch forth, I stretch out, I forget everything else that I may win Jesus, that I may come to Him, forgetting the past, forgetting all the sufferings, whatever it may be. I am never complacent. I am never satisfied. I will continually be a spiritual beggar because that's who I am when it comes to my Lord and Savior. And then Jesus said, they are the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom. Spiritual beggars, poor and needy, they are the ones that are going to inherit my kingdom. The exact opposite of the way the natural mind would think. And the exact opposite of the way many of those Jews had been taught. Jesus, out of his love and compassion, says, come to me, poor, needy, whoever you are, whatever your circumstances. And that goes true for we, his people, everyday saints. I want you to look at something here. Brother, if you'd bring up the first slide. Until you reach the shore of destitution, Jesus can do nothing for you. As long as there is self-sufficiency, as long as there is self-confidence, I can handle it. As long as you're looking at yourself and saying, I can do it, Lord, just let me go at it. Jesus cannot do anything for you. But you let somebody come, even we His people, in these destitute times, and come and hold up our hands and say, Jesus, I am poor, I am needy, I cannot do without you. I stand here this day, I'm not sufficient in myself to do it, but you can do it. If we do that, then Jesus will say immediately, my strength is sufficient and my grace is sufficient for you, no matter what the circumstances are. And you've reached that shore where Jesus is waiting with open arms saying, come to me. Especially if you are heavy laden and burdened. There was a storm that disciples were in. Remember that some of these disciples were fishermen. And the Lord had said, let's go to the other side. So they all got in the boat with the Lord and they headed to the other side. In the middle of the sea, a great storm came. Came right down upon the boat they were in, the Lord was in. Saints, let me just say one thing right here. Sometimes the Lord will allow you to go through storms. To reveal to you how destitute you are without Him. The storm comes and settles. And all of a sudden water waves is coming into the boat. And it's total panic. Here were fishermen now. They had been in storms before. But not like this one. And you want to know something saints. This time Jesus was in the boat. They panic, dishing out water. And the faster they poured it out, the faster it was coming in the boat. And in the midst of it, 
Jesus is sleeping. There will be times in your life when you're going through something. And it may seem like the boat is going down. And Jesus seems to be nowhere. In their panic, they run. They wake up Jesus. He gets up. Where's your faith? Let me just say this, saints. In the midst of the storms that's been going on, especially last year and into this year, one question Jesus is going to be asking you and I, where's your faith? He rebukes the wind and the waves, and everything is peaceful. They look at each other, listen to what they say. Who is this? I mean, they knew who he was. But you want to know something? In a circumstance of total destination, destination, they look at each other and saying, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know what it says? The wind and the waves still obey him. I don't care how much water comes in the boat. I don't care how roaring the sea and the wind is. They still know his voice. So here we have a situation that was total destitute. And in the next moment, how rich they were made in knowing that the creator of the universe was right there with them in that boat. Jesus had three friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And even the word says Jesus loved them. There came a time when Lazarus was deadly sick. And so they send a messenger to Jesus telling him to hurry up, get here right away. We are in desperate need. Now Jesus loves them. And you would think because he loved them so much that the first thing he, said, he would have said was, Everybody get, get packed up. We, we got to go. I got to get there before he dies. But no, that's not what Jesus did. He stayed there two more days. In fact, by the time they got ready to leave, Lazarus was already dead. So you can imagine now, we've got two sisters that totally believed the Lord. They walked with him. They knew him. Knew him very well. Oftentimes when he would be going down to Jerusalem, he would stop in Bethany where they lived. So you've got two sisters that are totally dependent on the Lord to be there. A day goes by. Lazarus is is more sick each day. And every day they're wondering, where is Jesus? Where is he? So finally, their brother dies and they bury him. Think about how destitute they were. Jesus still hadn't showed up. Lazarus in the grave. Jesus has not come. And uh, and the one they trusted and loved and knew that he loved them. And here they are totally destitute. There will be times in your life and my life. When Jesus doesn't show up when we think he should. Jesus finally comes. Lazarus had been in the grave four days. Martha runs out and listens to this cry of destitution. Jesus, 
if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And then, shortly after that, Mary comes out. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In all of that destitute condition they were in, think about this. What if Jesus had come on the scene and healed Lazarus? Think about how much richer they were when they saw their brother raised from the dead than if Jesus had come and healed him. So oftentimes, saints, when we are in certain circumstances, and the Lord does not come right away, and things are just, you know, and day by day we're getting anxious. And if we're not careful, fearful, because it seems like Jesus has not heard our destitute cry. But maybe Jesus has got something richer. That he wants to give us. How much greater riches was it. To know Jesus. I am the resurrection. Than to know Jesus. I am a healer. He knew he was both. But in this case. They had a greater richer knowledge. Of him. There is a difference in destitute between a non-believer and believer. I'd like for you to look at this, brother, if you'd bring up the next slide. Non-believers do not know they are destitute. True believers know they are destitute. Jesus was walking and he was going through Samaria. There's something I love about this. Talking about Jesus being totally dependent upon the Father. It says Jesus had to go through Samaria. But physically, Jesus really didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, sometimes the Jews, because they despised the Samaritans, they would, they would take a long route around Samaria to keep from going through there. Why did it say Jesus had to go through Samaria? Because that's what the Father told him to do. So he's going through Samaria. Now remember this. These Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were considered traitors. Many of the Jews that lived there had intermarried with Gentiles, Greeks. Therefore, they were outcasts as far as the Jews were concerned. And in fact, the Samaritans, they knew about a Messiah, but they didn't think he was coming to them. So Jesus is going through Samaria, and he stops in a little village, a little town called Sychar. He's at a well. The disciples had gone off to get food. So he's sitting at this well and a woman comes. Now here again, she had heard about a Messiah, but she was not a believer. She she didn't know more than what she had heard about him. She comes to get water out of the well. Now here's the thing. She didn't know she was destitute. She had no idea. But Jesus did. And the first thing he does is go after that destitute condition she was in. She was thirsty but not for water and he saw it. He begins a conversation with her. And she was totally shocked. She said, why are you asking me for water? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. So first of all, you have a woman that lives in a situation where nobody but where she lived would be around her. Samaritans were despised and she knew it by the Jews. So she expected the same thing from Jesus. 
But his love and compassion for her knew no bounds. He looked at her. He saw the destitute condition she was in. He begins a conversation. She said, I will give you the water. But then Jesus said, I have water that you know not of. That you won't have to come to this well anymore with this water. I've got living water. She still didn't understand what he was talking about. And then Jesus said to her, go get your husband. And she stands there, and I'm sure she was totally shocked. She said, I have no husband. Jesus looked at her and said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you now live with is not your husband. Now, here's the thing. Not one time during the conversation with that woman did he speak any condemnation to her. Not one time. He knew where she was at. You see, she was destitute and didn't know it. Think about it. All the rejection in those marriages that she had been through. And here she was with another man, and she had no idea how long that one was going to last. She was totally frail from a rejection standpoint. But Jesus saw it all. So he speaks to her, and then she says, well, she says, I can see that you're a prophet. And then the conversation goes on. The disciples return. So here, this woman, totally destitute, totally rejected all of her life, practically, and probably rejected by the people she lived around. And here she is. She leaves and she goes off to the village, to the town where the other people are. And she says to them, Come and see a man that has told me everything about me. So the whole town comes out. And here is Jesus standing there with his disciples. They talk to Jesus. They persuade him to come back to the town, to the village with them. And it says Jesus stayed there two more days. I can imagine his disciples, the shock not only does he go back to the village where they were, he decides to stay two more days. You know why? Because his love and compassion wouldn't let him leave. But here is the wonderful thing, saints, out of all of this. Think about this. A destitute woman in a destitute circumstance and condition, she turned out to be the greatest witness and that whole town was saved because of her condition. Think about how much richer was that village by one woman. By one woman. Her testimony. He told me everything I ever did. True believers like you and I. Take the Apostle Paul for example. Here he was, all the persecution, all of the things he went through. And he had come to the point where he was totally destitute. In Romans, you'll read in Romans 7 where he talks about the warfare with the flesh that all of us go through. In the body. And he said, the very things that I want to do, I go out and do. And the very things I don't want to do, I go out and do them. It was a continual rationale. But listen, listen to this cry, this destitute cry. He says, oh wretched man that I am, who is going to save me from this body of sin? Even in the ministry. 
him talking about the ministry of the Lord had committed to them, him, he said, how am I sufficient for these things? And then he said, my sufficiency is not of myself. My sufficiency comes from the God that I know. And then he said, I die daily. He was never satisfied where he was with the Lord. He said, I will count everything a loss, everything a waste, that I may win Jesus. When he talks about apprehending and being apprehended, he's talking about his fellowship with the Lord. Jesus did not apprehend Paul just for him to be an apostle and all the revelations. Jesus first re revealed himself to him so that he could bring Paul into the fellowship that he wanted him to be in. Then he could be all of these other things. But Paul had learned through his life, through all his ministry, that he was destitute. He could do nothing without Jesus being with him. And saints, here's the thing. No matter how much God may use you, no matter how great the ministry you have that has been committed to you, how small it's all wonderful in the eyes of the Lord. But no matter what that ministry is, never come to the place where you're not destitute. You think because I'm anointed or the Lord's committed this to me and now He wants me to just run with it. Not so. No matter the ministry, we should all be destitute knowing that without Him, we can do nothing in this life. There are times when the Lord met people in such grave condition. But there are other times when they, here again, had no idea they were destitute. There was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus. Listen to what he asked Jesus. What good thing can I do? To inherit eternal life. The first thing the Lord said was. There's only one good and that's God. So immediately the Lord let him know. It's not your goodness that's going to get you there. And then. The, the uh, rich young ruler the Lord took, looked at him. And it said the Lord loved him. He had compassion. His love for him. And then the Lord spoke to him and said, obey these commandments. And he said, you know, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not kill. He, he listed a few when he uh, presented it to the young man. And as soon as Jesus was finished, it said the young man, his head fell. You see, he thought his wealth and him being good was going to get him there. That's what he thought. He had no idea how destitute he really was. So he walks away, and Jesus looks at the disciples and says, how hard it is for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven. He saw the death, and the thing is, the young man would not go all the way with Jesus. He was totally destitute and didn't know it. And he would not walk with Jesus because he was not willing to give up the things of this life for Jesus. I'd like for us to look at one more thing as I near a close in this. If you'd bring up the last slide, brother. The bedrock of Jesus Christ's kingdom is destitution. I can't do it on my own. I can't get there on my own. I can't go through this circumstance on my own. And that's exactly where the Lord wants you. And I want you to look at this here. The recent events of this hour 
should have awakened us to realize how destitute we are without Jesus. I want you to think about the pandemic for a minute. Especially last year when it first started. When it started, it came in like a mighty rushing wind. And think about it. It was totally out of control. We couldn't control it. It was killing people. It was destroying people's lives. And we could not stop it. And the thing about it is too. We didn't have a remedy for it. We were totally destitute. And it's still going on. Yes, it is. It's still going on now. We've got a vaccine, yeah. But it's still raging on. If only our nation could have realized how destitute we really are. If we could have only realized it. If we God's people could have only realized that without Him, we're not going to make it through this. And we're not, saints. I can tell you now. I've spoken before about the hour of trial and temptation that's recorded in Revelation 3. And we're in that hour right now. So we have to come to the place in this where we realize we're not going to make it through this unless we cling to Jesus every single day. So this morning, ask yourself, am I destitute? Am I emptied of myself? Am I destitute of myself that I am totally dependent on Jesus? That there is no independence whatsoever in me? So before I close, I want to make sure of one thing. Lizelle is back there being the wonderful grandmother that she is. But I'd like for her to come forward. She is. Thank you. And just for a moment, I want you to meditate on this thing. Am I destitute enough that there's no independence whatsoever? And let's sit and let Lizelle just minister for a few minutes.